Good evening. My name's Michael, and I'm here this evening to talk about the Trinity and to defend the Trinity. So, I have this article here called The Trinity Defended, and I'm just going to look, I'm going to refer to this as I do this chat, and I'd just like to say thank you for the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, these three are one. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to speak for your truth and to lift it up. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay. So, over many years, the doctrine of the Trinity has come under attack from a, a variety of groups. Some of these groups, like Jehovah's Witnesses, for example, Muslims, they deny that this scripture, that this doctrine is, is even found in the scripture. And they're often quick to point out that the word Trinity is to be found nowhere in the Bible. And this is correct. While the phraseology is not found in scripture, however, the concept of Trinity most certainly is. So I want to provide a definition of this important Christian doctrine explaining what exactly the Trinity is, as well as what it isn't. We'll, we'll then examine the scriptures to see whether they provide adequate substantiation of this concept. So what do we mean by when we talk about the Trinity? So writing in the early third century, in his against Praxis, Tertullian is credited with first employing the words Trinity, person, and substance to convey the idea of the Father, Son, and Spirit being in one essence, but not in one person. So this is what Tertullian writes. Thus, the connection of the Father in the Son, and the Son in the Paraclete, which is the Holy Spirit, produces three coherent persons who are yet distinct, one from another. These three are one essence, not one person. As it is said, I and my father are one in respect of unity of substance and not singularity of number. OK, so this concept was established as church orthodoxy at the famous Council of Nicaea, AD 325. The Nicene Creed speaks of Christ as God of God. Light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, yet distinct from the Father. OK, so the same essence, but a distinct person, a separate person from the Father. OK, so. So let's just define Trinity, OK, so within the one being or essence that is God. There exists three co-equal, co-divine, distinct persons, namely the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, who share that essence fully and completely. This concept is not to be confused with polytheism, polytheism which maintains that there are multiple gods. While Orthodox Christianity emphatically holds there to be only one God, we nonetheless understand God to be complete in his unity. The concept of Trinity is not also to be confused with the ancient heresy of modalism, which maintains that God exists in three different modes. The Son has never been the Father, and the Holy Spirit has never been the Son or the Father. Modalism is refuted by the picture given to us in all four Gospels. Matthew 3, 16 to 17. Mark 1, 9 to 11. Luke 3, 21 to 22. John 1, 32 to 34. So, so this is in which the Holy Spirit descends on Jesus in the form of a dove 
and a voice is heard from heaven which says this is my beloved son with him i am well pleased it should be noted that the father and the son that the father's son and spirit do not each make up merely a third of the godhead rather each of the three persons is god in the full and complete sense of the word so having shown that scripture emphatically rejects the notion that the father son and spirit are synonymous persons only five propositions remain to be demonstrated in order to provide biblical substantiation for the concept of the trinity and these propositions are these there is only one eternal god the father is the eternal god the son is the eternal god and the holy spirit is the eternal god although the father son and holy spirit are non-synonymous persons the concept of the trinity does not violate does not violate the law of non-contradiction so let's look at these in turn the bible teaches monotheism okay so the support for monotheism is extremely strong and supporting references are far too numerous to list here tonight. So no, nonetheless, let us content ourselves with a few examples. Deuteronomy 6 verse 4 says this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. I am the Lord, and there is no other. Besides me there is no God. I equip you, though you do not know me. Okay, the deity of the Father. This is the least controversial of the five points, and many of the verses cited above would suffice to demonstrate. Indeed, in the high priestly order of the Lord Jesus recorded in John 17, Jesus says to the Father in verse 5, Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. The Father is similarly referred to as God in John 3.16, which it reads, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Now, one would continue in this vein for some time, but since nobody is denying this contention, let us move on to consider the biblical support for the perfect and complete deity of Christ. And this is the deity of the Son. So the biblical support for the perfect and complete deity of Christ is very strong. So, for example, if we read Philippians 2, 5 to 11, it says this, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God, which is the father, exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every other name. OK. It says that the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. It says in the Old Testament about God, it says, as long as I live, every knee shall bow to me. Isaiah 43, 10 to 11 says this, you are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, so that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me, no God was formed, nor will there be one after me. 
I, even I, am the Lord. And apart from me, there is no saviour. Isaiah 44, 6 to 8 says this. This is what the Lord says. Israel's king and redeemer, the Lord Almighty. I am the first and I am the last. Apart from me, there is no God. Who then is like me? Let him proclaim it. Let him declare and lay out before me. What has happened since I established my ancient people and what is yet to come? Yes, let them foretell what will come. Do not tremble. Do not be afraid. Did I not proclaim this and foretell it long ago? You are my witnesses. Is there any God besides me? No, there is no other rock. I know not one. 1 Corinthians 8 verse 6 says, Yes, for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. Okay. Titus 2.13 says, We wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. The Apostle Peter addresses his second epistle. He says, Those who through the righteousness of our God and Saviour, Jesus Christ, have revealed a faith as precious as as ours. Isaiah 46 says the Lord is the only saviour. He is the only God. And here we have our great God and saviour Jesus Christ. So this is speaking in Trinitarian language. It's including Christ as deity as well as the Father. Okay. Colossians 1 15 to 20 says this. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and things on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things. And in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead. So that in everything he might have the supremacy. For the Father God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. And through him to reconcile to himself all things. Whether things on earth or things on heaven. By making peace through his blood shed on the cross. So the passage uses the word firstborn. In this context, the sense is that Christ is the the heir and all things are his rightful inheritance. Not in the sense that he himself is a created being. Colossians 2 verse 9 says, asserts that in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. Even in the Old Testament in Isaiah 9 verse 6 to 7 we read this For to us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of Of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom establish and uphold in it with justice and righteousness. From that time on and forever, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Okay. So... There are numerous occasions in the scripture where titles 
are inscribed to Yahweh, the Father, and they're also attributed to Christ. So one example of this is the title of the Alpha and the Omega, or the first and the last. The title is ascribed to Yahweh in Isaiah 44, verse 6, and Isaiah 48, verse 12, as well as, well as in Revelation 1, verse 8. It is attributed to Jesus, however, in Revelation 1, 17 to 18. It is very clear from the context that it is Jesus who is speaking because he subsequently says, I am the living one. I was dead and behold, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. In Revelation 2, verse 8, in the letter to the church in Samanra says, These are the words of him who was the first and the last, who died and came to life again. This title is also attributed to Jesus in Revelation 21, 6, as well as in Revelation 22, 13. Verse 16 of Revelation 22 makes it very clear that it is Jesus speaking. For he says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright morning star. So we see that the name for God is interchangeable between the Father and the Son. And we have Christians have always said that Jesus is God, the Father is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. So, so far we have this parallel language which refers to Yahweh as God and also to the Son as God. Thus, we're now, we're now building and showing that the Trinitarian worldview is the correct worldview. Okay? So, so let's look at the deity of the Holy Spirit now. Okay. Okay. It says here, one very clear reference to the deity and personhood of the Holy Spirit occurs in Acts 5, 1 to 10, in which Ananias and Sapphira are charged with lying to the Holy Spirit and struck down dead as a consequence. Peter rebukes Ananias, saying, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit? You have not lied to human beings, but to God. So Peter is saying that to lie to the Holy Spirit is to lie to God. Okay. So here, not only does the personhood of the Holy Spirit become apparent, but the Holy Spirit is also equated with God himself. So here's another example in Acts 13 verses 1 to 2. In which the Holy Spirit speaks and calls out Paul and Barnabas, sending them out for the work ordained for them. In this passage, the Holy Spirit clearly assumes divine authority. And this is what he says, the Holy Spirit. Now in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Simon, called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, and Saul. While they were worshipping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. So the Holy Spirit is assuming divine authority there. Ephesians 4.30 says, um, In which we are instructed, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. So here the Holy Spirit displays the attributes of personhood. One cannot grieve an impersonal force. Okay, it's clearly a divine person. So the Holy Spirit is endowed with a will. 1 Corinthians 12, 11 says, All these are the work of, of one and the same Spirit, and he distributes them to each one, just as he determines. 
1 Corinthians 2, 10 to 11 also ascribes knowledge to the Holy Spirit. It says the Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who knows a person's thought except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God. Really listen to this passage. In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. Okay. Mark 3.29 indicates that it's possible to blaspheme against the Holy Spirit. Only God is to be blasphemed against. Psalm 139, 7 to 10 indicates that the spirit of God is omnipresent. It's everywhere. And it says, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you were there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn. If I settle on the far side of the sea. Even there your hand will guide me. Your, your right hand will hold me fast. So we also learn in Hebrews 9, 14, that the Holy Spirit is eternal. And it says Christ, who through the eternal spirit, Offered himself unblemished to God. Okay. So there's another scripture in the Bible. And it says this. It says. Where the spirit of the Lord is there is freedom. And it says the Lord is the spirit. Okay. So another thing that I'm going to do tonight as well. And I've not heard many people mention this when they talk about the Holy Spirit, the Father and the Son. I'm going to go to the book of Genesis. Because right at the beginning, right at the beginning of the history of creation, we have the Holy Spirit. We have the Father and we have the Son. And I'm going to read the passage and expound on these things. So Genesis 1 says this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. OK, the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. So in the beginning, we have God and we have the spirit of God hovering over the face of the waters. OK, I'm going to read another passage in Genesis now referring to Christ. OK. Just give me one second. Ah, here we go. So after Adam. And Eve fell in the Garden of Eden. Uh, when I'm reading Genesis 3, 13 onwards. So this is just after when Adam and Eve ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Because God said, there's two trees in the garden. If you eat from the tree of life, you'll live forever. But if you eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you will surely die. And the devil deceived them and she ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed, he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Now, the context of that passage is this. So this, this, this is the promise of a child. Okay, the term seed is important. 
and it's translated offspring or descendants. And the term is referring to an individual. So the seed of the woman is the promised one, the coming Messiah of Israel, Jesus Christ. So the word seed continues to be used throughout the Bible as a messianic term. And you'll see that in Numbers 24, verse 7 and Isaiah 6, 13. So the meaning of the phrase your seed as it applies to the serpent is uncertain. So let's just read that again. So it says here, the reference is ultimately to Satan. And it says your head. This is sometimes called the first gospel because these words, as indirect as they are, as they are, promised the coming one whom we know to be the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah. The Lord was showing mercy even as he judged. Bruises heel speaks of a serious injury, but it is contrasted with the bruising of the head to defeat of the serpent seed. When Jesus went to the cross, he was bruised in his heel. That is, he suffered a terrible but temporary injury. In his resurrection, he defeated his enemy from that moment on. Satan has lived on borrowed time. He is already defeated. Only an announcement of victory needs to be given. Okay, so this passage is talking about Jesus Christ. In the very first book of the Bible, we have the Spirit of God hovering over the face of the waters. And we have, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And here's another one to throw in there as well. In the book of Ephesians, it says God created all things through Jesus Christ. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, if you go to the book of John, it says in John, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God. And the word was God. I've got to read the rest of the passage. I'm going to give you some exegesis on this passage. Okay. So in the beginning, and it's referring back to Genesis 1 verse 1. And this starts with the moment of creation, and it moves forward to the creation of humanity. John starts with creation and contemplates eternity past. The fact that the word was with God suggests a face to face relationship. In the ancient world, it was important that persons of equal station be on the same level or face to face when sitting across from one another. Thus, the word with indicates a personal relationship, but also implies equal status. So remember when I read Philippians, it says he he humbled himself and became a man. And he said equality with God is not something to be grasped. But he humbled himself. Even though he was on equal terms with the Father, he humbled himself. The word Jesus Christ himself is an active person in communication with the Father. Moreover, the word was God. The word order in Greek shows that the word was God, not a God, as the Jehovah's Witnesses like to put in their translation of the New World of the, of the New Testament. This is a straightforward declaration of Christ's deity, since John uses word to refer to Jesus. The word was of the very quality of God while still retaining his personal distinction from the Father. OK, so at this point, neither the person of Christ nor his sonship came into being at a point in time. Rather, the Father and the Son have always been in a loving fellowship with one another. OK, it says all things were made through him. God, the father created the world through God, the son. All creation was made through him. Thus, he is the creator God. So. They are distinct persons of the Godhead. The, obviously, Jesus is not the father and the father is not Jesus, but they share the essence that is God. Trinity. OK. So the Trinity is there in the very beginning of Genesis and John. We can refer to the book of John many thousands of years later to make the case even stronger. 
So, I'm just going to read to you a ch some church fathers, and then I'll end the stream soon. So this is Clement of Alexandria, and he's quoting, and he says this, Oh, mystic marvel, the universal father is one. The one, the universal word, and the Holy Spirit is one, and the same everywhere. Okay. Do you remember what it says in Deuteronomy? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. There is actually plurality in the Godhead. I'm going to go back to Genesis again to, to prove that as well. Okay. So, Genesis 1, 26 says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Okay. So let us make is emphatic. It emphasizes the majesty of the speaker. Furthermore, the use of a plural for God allows for the later revelation of the Trinity. See Matthew 28, 19. The us cannot refer to the angels that are present with God because man is made in the image of God alone. Not also that of the angels in our image. What is the image of God in man? The traditional view is that God's image is certain, it's moral, it's ethical, and it has intellectual abilities. A more recent view based, view based on Hebrew grammar and the knowledge of the ancient Middle East interprets the phrase as meaning, let us make man as our image. So in ancient times, an emperor might command statues of himself to be placed in remote parts of his empire. These symbols would declare that these areas were under his power and reign. So God placed humankind as living symbols of himself on earth to represent his reign. This interpretation fits well with the command that follows to reign over all that God has made according to our likeness. OK. So. I'm going to make give you another scripture as well here. Genesis 3. 22 says and I'll just give you a little context on it as well so you know where I'm up to with this this was after the fall God cursed the ground and God made tunic to skin and clothed Adam and Eve then the Lord God said behold the man has become like one of us to know good and evil okay notice that word us yeah, it has a plural meaning. OK. So the Trinity. The Trinity. Is right there from the beginning of the Bible, the doctrine of the Trinity, on the other hand, that was formulated much later after the after the New Testament, not much later, not loads later. But the point hit. The point being is that the, the doctrine of the Trinity is just emphasizing what's already written in Scripture. And what's written in Scripture was there before the Trinity, the doctrine of the Trinity was even formulated. The Trinity has always existed. The doctrine came in a little bit later, but it doesn't detract from the fact that that's what the Scripture is saying right from the beginning. So, God has revealed himself in three persons, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So, the evidence and the scriptures are overwhelming. Origen says, from all which we learn that the person of the Holy Spirit was of such authority and dignity that saving baptism was not complete except by the authority of the most excellent trinity of them all, i.e. by the naming of, naming of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit, and by joining to the unbegotten God, the Father, and to his only begotten Son, the name also the Holy Spirit. So 
So I'll show you. I'll show you that so you can see it. Quotes on the Trinity by the early church fathers. Justin Martyr said. This is Justin Martyr. For in the name of God the Father, and Lord of the universe, and of our Saviour Jesus Christ, and of the Holy Spirit, they then received the washing with water. Ignatius says, For if there is one God of the universe, the Father of Christ, of whom are all things, and one Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord, by whom are all things, and also one Holy Spirit, who wrote in Moses and in the prophets and apostles. Ignatius also says this, Since also there is but one unbegotten being, God, even the Father and one only begotten Son, God the Word and man and one comforter, the spirit of truth and also one preaching and one faith and one baptism. It says in Ephesians, there's one Lord, one faith, one Father, one Holy Spirit. Okay? So there's unity. There's unity. But the Holy Spirit does not speak his own things, but those of Christ. And that not from himself, but from the Lord. Even as the Lord also announced to us the things that he received from the Father. For says he, the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. And says he of the Holy Spirit, he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever things he shall hear from me. And he says of himself to the Father, I have, says he, glorified thee upon the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me. I have manifested thy name to men. And of the Holy Ghost, he shall glorify me, for he received of mine and makes it known. So the Holy Spirit pleases to Christ, speaks the words of Christ. Okay? They're all in agreement with one another. God bless you. Thank you for listening. Amen.